to have me on camera before the reel was finished. Uh, my name is Adam Hartel, and um, I get to have uh, the dream job of being a Nomen rep, which means I get to do things like this. I get to share with people about uh, careers in digital production and how Nomen's educational offerings are helping artists uh, get those careers. Um, so today's stream is going to be fantastic. Uh, we are going to be spending some time with Jared Morantz. And if you are not familiar with Jared, uh, maybe just a few of you might not be, uh, Jared is a prolific uh, concept artist and uh, creature designer. And um, before I share information about Noman later on in the stream and talk about some of the things that we're doing, I want to spend a good length of time uh, hearing from Jared, uh, talking with him about his artwork and his process. So um, just give me a moment and I'm going to pull up Jared's bio here. We just had a couple of little glitches that um, kind of took a few things away from us here, but I'm going to pull that up right now. You guys don't mind bearing with me. Uh, let's see here. Very good. Oh, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Well, um, it wouldn't be a, a live show without a couple of technical glitches, but now we can jump into it, guys. Um, so I'd like to share really quickly with you um, Jared's bio. Uh, Jared Esmerant started his career at an early age interning for special effects houses. Uh, trying a little of everything enabled him to narrow his focus to creature design and concept art. His acquired skills in sculpture, painting, illustration, 3D modeling, and Photoshop all aid his unique sense of design. Uh, Marantz's many credits span over the film, television, and game industries and include Avengers Infinity War and Endgame Spider-Man Far From Home, Doctor Strange, Guardians of the Galaxy 1 and 2, Justice League, Batman vs. Superman, Deadpool 2, Shazam, Dune, Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2, X-Men Apocalypse, X-Men Days of Future Past, The Conjuring, um, Rise and Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, Noah, Clash of the Titans, he was the lead designer on that project, American Horror Story, Grimm, Westworld, Lovecraft County, which is an amazing, if you haven't seen that, you got to get on that, it uh, came out uh, this year and you got to, it's a fantastic series, um, Gears of War uh, 4 and 5, Titanfall, Infamous 2, and the list goes on, guys. Uh, you can find more of Jared's artwork on his art station and Instagram page, and we'll make sure that we uh, we get the links to that in the chat today. So with that, guys, I just want to say, Jared, welcome to the stream. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks. Oh, hey, there I am. Hey. Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Uh, yeah, good to be here. Very excited to uh, do another Nomen event. Um, you guys are great. Love talking to you, Adam. Yeah, I know you've been a longtime friend of Nomen. It's great to have you back. Um, and one of the things, you know, one of the one of the few positive side effects of a really weird year in quarantine is we're doing more streaming content mm -hmm. um, at Nomen, which allows us to get these fantastic events, time spent with artists such as yourself out there to the world, essentially. So I'm sure we've got a lot of international viewers. We've got a lot of local viewers here in the U.S. I'm sure we've got Nomen students um, watching as well, uh, as well as a lot of aspiring artists out there. So um, I think we're in for a great time today, guys. Um, so yeah, just kicking it off, um, I wanna I'm gonna share my screen here because I've got some some artwork that you've helped me put together that we just want to put up while we talk um, because there's nothing better than getting to see the art by the artist that we're talking to. So um, yeah, we'll just get Thanos up there right away. I love sharing a screen with Thanos; it's awesome. Um, so Jared, uh, maybe just at the, at the top here, um, could you share with us a little bit about your journey, like uh, going going back to the says you got involved at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about that in your formative years? Uh, yeah, you know, I was uh, very lucky to figure out that um, you can make a living being a concept artist at an at an early age. I somehow connected the dots. I remember going to uh, Barnes and Noble and, you know, back in the, in the nineties, um, mm -hmm. you know, there wasn't a lot of information on concept art. I picked up a star Wars book and I just, it just clicked. It was like, Oh, this is somebody's job. And uh, you know, I, I fell in love with it. And there were a few other moments. I remember seeing, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when I was a kid and realizing that there was a team of people who designed and sculpted and, put uh, people in creature suits and I wanted to do that, um, especially because of course, you know, uh, wasn't that aware of, of uh, visual effects and, and, you know, what would come in the future. So I was obsessed with uh, practical effects and I uh, started drawing and sculpting 
I think I've always drawn and sculpted, but then uh, with that information, I was able to focus it and it was, it was tunnel vision. It was just um, uh, drawing what I was passionate about, which was uh, monsters all the time, all the time. Yeah. And, um, fortunately, my parents were supportive enough. I got to uh, go to an amazing school called Associates in Art in Van Nuys. And that school was incredible because it was it was the birth of it was the the uh, very first you know Nomen Lafa you know all of these these um, schools CDA Red Engine like this is what the prototype basically it was called uh, Associates in Art it was in uh, uh, Van Nuys of all places and it was a school where industry professionals actually taught and. Finally, you know, I was just, I was in that environment. I was one of the youngest guys there. There was, um, I didn't realize it at the time, but there was another kid there. His name was, it was uh, Alexander Mandergief. And we ended up becoming uh, best friends, going to high school together and, and uh, occasionally worked together at, at Marvel. Really very talented guy. Um, but aside from him, I was the only other kid there. And I ended up taking a creature sculpting class. And from there I got an internship at a practical effects house when I was um, 14. And wow. yeah, it was very, I was very fortunate. Um, and uh, I, I spent a summer at a practical effects house called Soda Effects. It was a, uh, a practical effects house. They, they did a lot of low budget films in Van Nuys. And um, I got to see how everything was was made. And the most valuable thing was that as I was there and I was I was assisting on like sculptures, mold making, uh, all kinds of stuff, just fabricating. And when I say assisting, I, I really mean just getting in everybody's way. Like I had no delusions of being, you know, you know helpful or anything else. They were just very kind and let me hang out and they let me sculpt the mask and it was it was fun, um, but it was at that point where I realized that I didn't care about um, the other stages in developing, you know, practical effects as much as I did care about design. Mm, and so yeah. that sent me on that path on just like, okay, how how are characters and creatures designed? What what are the industry standards? Because you know there was a lot of information out there, um, and there were a lot of schools, but you know they were, they didn't know, they really didn't know um, what the standards were and, and what studios wanted. And so from that point, it was just trying to get, um, I was just focused on trying to get a job at a big practical effects house like Stan Winston's and Rick Baker's. Uh, yeah. I just worked on my portfolio, uh, did figure drawing. I did as much foundation as I would allow myself to do. I was still I was still a child, so very um, very impatient. I always wanted to do uh, monsters. Uh, I eventually ended up going to a high school for the arts, LA County High School for the Arts, which was great because mm -hmm. I think I could have survived in a normal high school. Um, and I was able. It was it was academic uh, half of the day, and then the other half, the, the later half of the day, uh, we had art classes. Uh, actually, uh, my wife went there as well. She uh, she was a uh, theater student, and I was uh, obviously a visual artist. Um, and uh, I was able to refine my portfolio even further. And then I was able to go directly from um, from Loxa, LA County for the Arts, uh, to Art Center in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And it was at this point that I realized that design was primarily a two D thing. So I had spent a lot of time uh, sculpting in clay, and I realized that you know you very rarely see a maquette in these art of books, um, even in practical effects houses. If the designs were not executed there, um, they would get two D artwork typically from an art department. So dimensional work was kind of starting to fade away, or in in many cases later in the pipeline, like they would have. Mm -hmm. Uh, 2D artists sketching and drawing, which you know it makes perfect sense. You can you can do a drawing a lot faster than you can sculpt a maquette. So maquette itself ended up being um, a design process that at times was later in the in, in the design process. And I realized that I wanted to get in there at the at the ground 
level. So Art Center was about focusing on, on 2D drawing and painting and understanding it. And I, I fought it still. It was not fun and I was not very disciplined. So I was not a good student, but still had the focus of just um, just just getting a portfolio that would get me through the door at San Winston's at Rick Baker's. Finally, I graduated and uh, I, I was able to set up an interview at Stan Winston's and I got hired on the spot. And then from there, it was just jumping from one practical effects house to the other and, you know, building my client list um, and eventually working for bigger studios, joining the union. Um, so it was, it was a long road. I mean, you're talking about well over 20 years of just being focused on, on one path. Um, to be honest, like I, it's not something that you can easily just fall into. Uh, maybe now you can, maybe now because things are more accessible, it, it, it's possible. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that was it in a nutshell. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that's, it's an interesting point. And I, and I do want to take a little bit of time to talk about that a little bit later is that idea of everything is a lot more accessible. And you know maybe there is the potential to to streamline some of the learning process, mm -hmm. um, but you know there are some things that'll always be true um, when it comes to learning art, and we'll we're definitely going to tap into that. Um, so uh, yeah, Ed, what an amazing story. So you were, uh, if I can ask, you know you you got your first you were kind of in your first effects house at age fourteen, mm -hmm. um, and that that point um, that you. You know, how many years later are we talking? Then you got that. I think it was a job at Stan Winston. Is that right? You got hired on the spot. Yeah, I think it was. How, how many years from that point to that point? Well, I, I went through college, so twenty-two minus fourteen was that the eight, <laughs> so eight years. Um, yeah. The the funny thing, and that that kind of killed me, was um, I I I had a portfolio, so it was it was all creature stuff all throughout high school, and I was working on small things through high school, um, a little bit in college, here and there, I'd, I'd pick up like a, you know, a small maquette gig or, um, you know, do some sketches for, for a potential client. Nothing, nothing truly noteworthy. But uh, the funny thing was, um, I, I remember showing my portfolio to uh, Kevin Chen, who's, who's a phenomenal uh, figure drawing teacher and my buddy who I'd mentioned before, Alex Mandergia was raving about Kevin Chen. And if um, if you ever had a chance to, to take his figure drawing, you, you have to, He's he is the best. Uh, and I finally got to meet Kevin, uh, who ended up becoming you know a lifelong friend. Um, and uh, he was flipping through my portfolio when I had just gotten into Art Center and I had just signed up for a mountain of debt. And he said, why aren't you working currently? And it did not occur to me <laughs> uh, that I was capable enough um, to just start working. Uh, so that kind of haunted me for a bit. But looking back, um, I think I wouldn't have been able to get as far uh, yes. if, if I didn't have the formal education, or at least if I wasn't in an environment where I had no choice but to do things that, that I was not disciplined enough to do on my own. Um, I was Absolutely. not enough to just draw, you know, a hundred hands in a week. I wouldn't do it. I would, <laughs> I'd draw one hand and then I'd think, oh, that's cool. Maybe if it turns into a monster and then I'd be doing hand monsters. Um, even in figure drawing classes, it was very hard for me to stay on model and not turn them into demons or, or something. Sure. <laughs> uh, it wasn't great. Necessarily, I don't know if it was necessarily an overactive imagination. I, I used to think so because that's the most flattering way to think of it. And what I really think it was, was just, um, not being disciplined and wanting to uh, reward myself and feed my own ego. Like that's what I, I'm realizing mm -hmm. it was. It's like, ah, I'm not nailing this likeness, but I don't have to if it's a demon. So, you know, you just- Ah, oh, okay, yeah. Well, I, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, one of the really interesting things to me about your story um, as you've shared it with us is, you know, you have roots in sculpture that was kind of one of the first things you're spending a lot of time doing. And then yeah. you you moved more towards 2D because at the time that's where the design world lived was mm -hmm. all in 2D. Um, and then, you know, it all it seems almost like coming full circle because now you're doing a lot of work in ZBrush in yeah. digital 3D um, as a lot of the stuff that we've been looking at on the screen here. I'm gonna go to the next slide here. 
which is from uh, Lovecraft Country. Mm -hmm. um, so good. Um, and you know, what was that like for you? Because um, the experience that I've had in in three D in in special sculpture, it's very much influenced my two D art, my my mm -hmm. my drawing skills and anatomy and things like that, and vice versa. So, what was that journey like for you? Kind of going through the two D world and then uh, back to getting to do a lot of you know sculpture again um, for design. Well, two D. Uh I always found it incredibly challenging because um, 3D was more immediate, more rewarding. And I've, I've said it before um, in, in many lectures, the, uh, the, the lack of responsibility um, in, in 3D, in, in, in sculpting, it might not be the best way to phrase it, lack of responsibility, but, but you know, um, there's, there's a lot less to worry about when you're sculpting. You have to make sure that your form is great, but you know, you open up a bag of clay. You already have perspective, light, form, dimension. You just have to push it around. Whereas you know, two D art, you just have the void of like a white page, and you've got, mm -hmm. to, you've got to make everything. You got to figure out how it exists in that space. You have to plot it out in perspective, um, which I, I do a lazy little like ground plane and then build up. But um, still, it's it's more than uh, you have to worry about when you know you're modeling something in three D or you're just you know sculpting something in clay. Uh, I had at one point really regretted the amount of time I had spent in clay until ZBrush came out. And like everything, uh, I fought it. I fought ZBrush because it was very uh, sterile and alien to me. Uh, it was really my first, mo it wasn't quite my first modeling program. Like uh, I took a light wave class when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, again, Associates in Art taught by a very talented practical effects artist uh, that did visual effects stuff on the side, uh, Andrew Clement. And um, it bored me to tears. I mean, I, I it was so sterile. It was so alien to me uh, after having such a, a, you know, a practical tactile um, background that I just could not embrace it. And I kind of swore it off for a while. And then it was only on the job after you know, I, I my first couple of jobs, I was on a drafting table, and my my job was just to generate tons and tons of ideas because my Photoshop skills weren't very good uh, coming out of college, um, and so I would just brainstorm, and that's how they utilized me over at Stan Winston's, and then later on at another visual effects house. Um, but what got me going to uh, Photoshop and uh, ZBrush was that I would execute the, I, I do tons of sketches, director would pick something he liked, and then someone else would, would build a model or, or resolve the design in Photoshop, and my signature was gone. So I, I couldn't let that happen. Um, so I picked up ZBrush, and it was just like clay. So within yeah. the first time of using ZBrush, I was actually able to uh, generate a decent image. Um, because anything that I couldn't sculpt at that point, you know, figuring out the interface or whatever, uh, I could paint in Photoshop. So I could just do these paint overs and I could, I could get these very resolved images suddenly. And then I was, I was sold. And now, um, I've been moving further and further away from Photoshop and I just am practically turning in, uh, turntables all the time because I'm, there's just so much that you can resolve in ZBrush and it's so fast. Um, still not as efficient in terms of exploring design, but definitely efficient in terms of resolving design. And it really depends on um, what kind of client you have. Like I like to throw sketches in the first uh, wave of designs for a new client. And if they do respond to the sketches, I do try to stay in 2D for a while uh, before moving into ZBrush because ZBrush does slow the process down and it is about realizing the design and refining as opposed to exploring options. But it, it really depends on the client. Some clients can read a sketch and you can stay there for a long time, primarily in video games, like always mm -hmm. video games. I can, I can do tons and tons and tons of drawings. Um, like this guy right here, this is the, um, the, the pouncer from Gears of War. Yeah. Uh, I was drawing for for a very long time before I got here, and that was that was awesome. Um, but yeah, it, it really depends on the client. A lot of clients for film, uh, 
maybe you do a rough sculpt and a paint over if they like it then you know you refine lately i've been doing this like uh, you know all my eggs in one basket thing which is kind of kind of dangerous but at least you get the opportunity to fully realize your concept uh, but it is time consuming and you do end up um, presenting the client with fewer options so it's it's a risk you really just have to feel out the situation well that. and it seems it seems like that you know all eggs in one basket approach uh, is going to be much more executable for someone who has a, a great level of experience, right? Because you you kind of have your shorthand down, as it were, um, in your process. Um, and that's one of the things that I see a lot is with as accessible as demos are now and everything's online and you can go check things out, you know, even streams like this. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's so tempting to just take take a, a leap to the mountain peak you know try it's it's like trying to jump on top of mount everest from base camp mm -hmm. um, you know there are definitely things out there that can help excel the process but um it's so good to to have to go through the process um you know especially early on the design iterations and all of the things that need to happen yeah and the um, best way to do that is on on paper if, if yeah. you're as confident in photoshop or on a tablet 2d uh the bottom line and you cannot escape this as a as a concept artist. Uh, you have to do terrible artwork, a lot of terrible artwork for years, so that your uh, brain knows what good design is. It takes it takes tons and tons and tons of, of iterations and, and, and attempts um, to ever get to a point where you're generating good ideas on a regular basis. And the only way to accomplish that mileage is through a medium that allows you to design. Uh, quickly. So yes. if you can fill a page of doodles um, of different options, you're going to be able to do that a lot more quickly than jumping from you know one model to the next. So just in terms of efficiency and becoming a good designer, you need a medium that is a lot faster than uh, than a 3D model. So drawing is, is important. You can't really get away from it. I've never met a concept artist that was exceptional uh they couldn't draw no matter how how they execute um you know i know guys who draw less than me uh on the job and you know when push comes to shove if they have a pencil and paper in front of them they can still do the job yeah or you may be in a in a design brief or design meeting where you're sitting around a conference table or something and all you've got is a piece of paper mm -hmm. and a sharpie or whatever and it's so helpful to be able to just iterate quickly yeah um on the spot um yeah, and I think that uh, if you could talk to us, you know, we, we don't have to take an insanely deep dive. I mean, this isn't a lecture for you or anything like that. But if you could talk to us a little bit about your process, um, you know, maybe aspects of your process, like you said, that incorporate a bit of 2D and then moving moving into 3D. And the nature, the reason for the question, for my part anyway, is you know, you've got a lot of 2D artists out there that are still kind of you know, like I don't want to work in 3D. That's not my thing. Um, who haven't yet enjoyed the benefits of that. And then you've got a lot of you know, folks that are going straight after 3D. They're like, well, I don't have to draw mm -hmm. you know, because I'm a 3D artist. So it's really great to get to talk to an artist that, that has, has been in both worlds and knows how to draw off of the benefits that both worlds have to offer. So is there anything you could unpack from your process that would help us to, to see into that a bit more? Well, I, I touched on it a little bit, um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so as, as I mentioned before, um, when I'm working with a client uh, and I do that first wave of designs, uh, mm -hmm. I, will, I will pepper in a few drawings. And if they respond to the drawings, uh, then I know, yeah, that's a good example, yeah. then I know that I can design this way for a while. And uh, this was actually my, my, uh, my tutorial, Alien Outlaws, where I demonstrate generating fast ideas. So I did about 20 mm -hmm. guys. Great tutorial, by the way. I've taken it. It's on Gumroad. Anybody who's interested should go check it out. Yeah, I wanted to make something uh, very, not, uh, very efficient and also kind of affordable. So, so you know, I, I kind of put it out there for cheap. Uh, and then I'm still trying to flesh out part two where I just take these and I just start to turn form and render them a bit. And then I'm going to take one of them and I'm going to model them out in ZBrush. But if you can find an efficient way to design in 2D and show complicated ideas, uh, then 
man, like this, this took me <clears throat> a couple of days to do 20 of these. Uh, mm -hmm. It took me a couple of days in ZBrush to do one, you know, so that, that's a really good example. Um, but as I, as I mentioned before, uh, I would pepper in some of the 2D work in my deliverables uh, to clients, and if they respond to the 2D work, then I stop working in ZBrush for a while. And um, I just see how far I can, I can take it. Sometimes uh, you don't have a choice, actually. Like, this is a great example. So these guys were actually cut out of Infinity War. And we were going to see Thanos' home planet at one point um, and, and spend a little bit of time with him growing up, um, which has been, like, documented in books and whatever. Uh, and we needed to see what his people looked like. And so they needed to see all of these different classes in a few days. Um, and so, yeah, I knew just by the nature of the job, I was like, oh, there's no way I'm sculpting this. <laughs> like, like, there's so many elements, like the amount of uh, people that I had to do, like I did children. Uh, right here we have like, like politicians, upper class, working class right here. Mm -hmm. And I ended up doing a few more sets. I had kids, and I forgot I forgot what else I did. Um, but the nature of the job is like, there's, there's no way I'm going to draw this. Like, sculpting fabric is a complete pain. Um, and just getting the, the range in different, you know, body types, and like, no, that doesn't work. I only have a few days. Uh, so I did tons of these. And that got, that got the job done. Um, not everybody wants a 3D same thing. That's video game right there. Uh, that mm -hmm. was the last Gears of War, um, the infected DBs. And Gears of War and it, all video games, for the most part, except for one project that was canceled, wanted to see uh, 2D drawings first. And I get such a kick out of doing this because I get so rusty when it comes to drawing. Like drawing is mm -hmm. one of the things where if you don't do it every single day uh, you lose it fast i've left i've left painting for a while and i've left um zbrush for a while and i i come back almost as good as the t the day i've left it uh drawing working 2d um uh, it just hurts it just hurts as a matter of fact you'll notice that you know there's a there's a bit of a range here like the guy in the center uh it's uh -huh. more paint than anything else so i couldn't draw yeah. at the point when i did that design and so I could think in flat shape and color. So I literally just painted that in flat color and started pulling some forms because I could wrap my head around that. I couldn't wrap my head around the line. Line is a very abstract thing that does not actually exist in the real world. It's, it's completely representational. Mm -hmm. So it is, a, it is a language that if you don't speak regularly, you will, you will lose it. Um, but, but yeah, clients determine my process quite a bit, what, what they can what they can handle um, and uh, what they can read. Um, but yeah, video games are great. When I'm, when I'm working at Marvel, uh, I have done some, some 2D work at Marvel, um, but they give, me, they give me some time. And typically when I, when I sketch, I do, I do ugly, terrible drawings and I'll show uh, you know, my, uh, my art director who will either be like Ryan Minerding, Andy Park, or uh, Ian Joyner. And they're all very, very talented people. So, I mean, I can I can show them some terrible drawings and get the yay or nay to start uh, sculpting or not. Um, but yeah, it really it really depends on the client. That's a really great point, by the way, because um, I've I've you know I've talked to a lot of different artists, and you know for the professionals, there's this idea of you can you can take something that is maybe not fully realized, maybe is a really rough sketch and show it to another artist because they're going to be able to interpret what you mean because it's it's mm -hmm. it's shorthand in a lot of ways um whereas you know you, you don't want to put that in front of say for instance someone who doesn't draw or right. doesn't understand how early in the process that is and i think that's so good for aspiring artists to hear um because they tend to feel like well, like i i don't want to show another artist or a senior artist where i'm you know something that's either incomplete or maybe something that I'm obviously struggling to, to get through, whereas actually that can be the person that can 100% help you um, roll forward. Yeah. Getting the right kind of feedback, the right kind of critique. Yeah, that shorthand, that, that ability to uh, get the conversation going with a doodle is, is essential, uh, regardless of, 
of what you want your work to be in the future. If you just want to model stuff and be considered a designer, it'd be very hard to do. If you can't, uh, if you can't draw and express ideas uh, very quickly, um, I was going to say something. What was it? Dang it. Uh, whatever. Go, go on. We, we might be able to circle back to it as well. Um, you know, and I and I think oh, that. Uh, of course. Oh yeah. Go ahead, please. Um, yeah, the one thing that I, I keep uh, pressing in my uh, in my lectures, or you know, whenever I get any questions from students, is to remember that once you go through your your journey of um, you know going to school and creating a portfolio and finding an aesthetic or a, a uh, a look that is actually in demand, which is which is pretty hard nowadays. Um, now you're going to end up designing for people who are not designers, and you cannot rely on their ability to read a drawing, or even in some cases to know what good design is. And everything that we see goes through that that filter, um, and uh, you might you might come up with something brilliant, something that you think is absolutely amazing that has never been seen before, but might not be appropriate for the project or it might not work with the sensibilities of the client. Um, and that's that's a lesson that you're going to have to uh, uh, absorb and uh, and get used to. Like that, that is the job. I've worked with some people who do want to take risks in design, um, but it's very rare. It's very rare. So if you were to look at my portfolio, um, it's definitely it's definitely resolved. Uh, but I wouldn't say there's anything really that that extreme and out there um, because I very rarely get a job where that's actually appropriate. Things are just kind of like dialed in. Like this is this is a good example actually here. Uh, Proxima Midnight for Avengers. Uh, Endgame and Infinity War. Uh, if you you've seen her in the comic, she has a very extreme headdress, and she's very tall and she's very lanky, and and really cool. Um, but when I started this design, uh, we couldn't do the big headdress, uh, so we had to find solutions. And it was me and a bunch of other crazy talented artists trying to figure out uh, what Proxima Midnight would look like. Like of all the characters in the uh, Black Order, more in the film Children of Thanos. Uh, Proxima Midnight could be easily accomplished practically. So this could just be an actor. Um, so we don't know what we're going to do. And so my idea to get around the horns, you know, the big, big horns, because we kind of, we kind of uh, use that on Hela. And so she mm -hmm. had her own look was I decided to make them uh, bones and horns, actual horns coming, coming out of her cheekbones. And uh, I was working on the other characters at the time. So this was, this was a rough sculpt with, with some Photoshop paint and uh, it got approved. And then from here, we have, you know, the other um, exploration, uh, it had already gotten approved. Uh, I ended up designing a new arm for her, the armor. We couldn't do a mechanical arm anymore. There are way too many of those in the Marvel universe. <laughs> yes, there so, are a lot of those. Yeah, you got, you know, Winter Soldier cable, mm -hmm. two Colossus arms, whatever, the list goes on. And, um, uh, they realized that, that they had to see her arm through it. So it had to be specifically armor. So I started cutting through it and, and uh, sculpting something different. But at this stage, you know, the design's pretty much approved that they wanted to see a, uh, a sash on her or, or some kind of like Spartan skirt. And I, I like this version, um, but they ended up losing it and going with, with the earlier bodysuit idea that I had. Uh, but this is this is the process. So once once you're able to get something to land, it's just like refinement, 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 option, 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 paint over, paint over, paint over, and it can go on. It can go on for a while. It takes it takes clients uh, a very long time to approve things most of the time. Sometimes uh, it happens immediately. I've I've had a couple of instances where my first pass ends up on screen probably less than five times in 20 years. Um, and, and let's see, so yeah, 20 years of, of pursuing it, um, 15, 15 years, well, I've been pursuing it all my life. Uh, I, it's 15 years on the legitimate side of the job. So, so outside of um, practical effects, low budget practical effects, I was just not being a kid graduating from college 
um, and really earning a paycheck doing it, I'd say 15 years. Yeah. Um, if, if you don't mind me jumping in at this point, um, because we talked about this image before the stream, yeah. um, and it, just because of where you're at right now and what you're talking about, um, you know, there's there can be a misconception out there for people who want to do concept art and they confuse it for illustration. Mm -hmm. Whereas illustration can be a skill that's involved in concept art, but really a lot of it is, you know, and to, you know, to a real quick glance, somebody might look at all, all uh, four of these, these, these images and say, well, they all kind of look the same, mm -hmm. um, but there are real subtle shifts that make such a difference in design and in final execution. And uh, isn't that a lot of the job It's just, you know, doing something over and over and not trying to make it picture perfect or 100% beautiful, but just to get the idea across. Yeah, if you can make it picture perfect and beautiful, then you're definitely ahead of the curve. Um, <laughs> and you know, if they're willing to give you that kind of time, then you can do it, um, but it, it is tedious and it does, it does get tedious and they can be indecisive. I've, I've taken models um, design models all the way through and then have it completely scrapped even on um, on warrior Thanos specifically I designed you know his look for um, for some of uh, endgame and infinity war would be just the armor um, and I had actually gotten an entire other version completely resolved in ZBrush before they scrapped it um, and it, that was a very, very challenging process because some jobs, they just only have the budget for me and they hand me a character. Or, um, you know, in other jobs, they'll hire me and then they'll hire other artists and then, you know, I'll just kind of get the, get the job. But they're not that many artists. But at Marvel, they hire the best of everyone and then they put those guys uh, on each character. And so I'll be, I'll be working on these characters. And five other guys who are insanely good are working on these characters. Um, so it gives them those options. Plus, because they're hiring so many artists, you can turn in less. You know, you can just do like one or two options, and they still have that stack of JPEGs um, to go through. But uh, once your design gets through the first hurdle, you know, there might be a couple of other hurdles, and other designers are still involved. But then finally, you have it. And uh, and then it's just variation after variation after variation. Yeah. I agree. And uh, they can pull the rug out and then completely, you know, go away from it, which was the case on Thanos. On Thanos, um, the directors uh, really liked my version, and then uh, it got it got higher up the, the chain, and and Feige didn't like it, and it just just went away. And I had already put a lot of work into it, so I was a little de devastated, but um, then I ended up doing another pass just because they responded well to my first pass, and then I ended up doing this version of Thanos, but I, I ended up <clears throat> putting all my eggs in one basket and just decided to just build the armor completely. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it worked, and I, you know, it was, uh, I, got, I got lucky. Um, and it is, it, it's, a, it's skill plus luck, um, and, and I'm noticing that that at a certain point, everyone's really good. <laughs> like you can't, like everybody's good. Um, and it just boils down to whose idea fits the story best. And that's also a moving target because the story is being refined as you are designing. So at one point your idea might work very well and then it won't work. And of course, if it's a visual effect, character or creature, uh, they might continue that journey without you uh, through a visual effects house. Like it might go to like ILM or something. And, you know, they have very capable designers uh, over there and they might adjust the work. And so it, it's this big mystery when it gets on screen. Um, that's why I do like practical costumes from time to time because chances are that won't change <laughs> um, once they've shot it. So it, it is it is tricky. Um, I don't even remember the question you asked. What was it? Um, it, I you know it's it's okay because the uh, journey the journey is so fun right now, mm -hmm. um, and I like the turn that we've taken in the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I w I think a follow up question though to what you've been talking about is, and I think especially for artists out there that are wanting to lean into production mm -hmm. and that and that pipeline that process, how what are some of the ways that you've been able to 
you know, develop, for lack of a better term, kind of that thick skin that's needed when you pour yourself into a design or you pour yourself into a project, and then it ultimately doesn't get used. Oh, huh? thick skin. Uh, I think you just get older and uh, <laughs> and you just, you know, you just become, become callous. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what it what it was. I think um, I, ha I had a, a quality uh, that that was different uh, growing up than a lot of artists. And I think um, uh, that helped me. My quality was that I would draw something, and I would I would always want to show it to people, always. Uh, and a lot of artists hide their work, and so from an early age. I of course got a lot of praise, but I also got you know the occasional person who's like, I don't get it. It's terrible. But why would you even draw that? Um, and so I did get used to it. Uh, not to to say that you know the disappointment of not some, getting something approved uh, didn't hurt. Hurt? I don't even know if that's the word. I don't know. Um, I I also like. I so so working working in in practical effects, interning in practical effects, and being around those artists uh, also helped because that that really ripped the Band-Aid off. There are some guys who would, you know, just mess with me um, <laughs> and, and, you know, make sure I didn't feel that I was, I was too special. And uh, that, that probably helped quite a bit. Um, knowing that being able to laugh at yourself uh, is, is very important and not take yourself too seriously um, and be okay with, with screwing up or, um, you know, not getting it right. That that's a long journey in itself. I used to be devastated as a child when I would hit a, uh, a, a wall. It wasn't usually a creative wall, but a technical wall. When I realized that, Oh, I can't draw a hand. I still can't draw a hand very well, but um it used to really upset me as as uh, as a child, and so I think just through the process of, of trying and, and staying with it, um, it stung a little less as as the years passed by. I can't remember the last time I was truly disappointed. There was actually a, sh a show recently um, where the design was between me and another artist, uh, and. And I did, I, I, I did become a bit invested. I was, I was a little surprised. Um, I mean, that was, that was, that was just before the pandemic. So I think, I think I am. If it, if it gets me, if it gets me, if I suddenly care, suddenly, uh, then yeah, I can, I can, I can put that extra work in, and I can want it. Um, uh, but yeah, if it doesn't get approved, then you know I get I get calls all the time for work. So you know I'll, I'll get the next thing through. And another thing that I, I do as a freelance artist is I'm usually working on multiple projects at a time. So that that actually really helps. Like I've worked on shows where I'm like oh, I'm not quite nailing it, but uh, this other gig I'm nailing it. <laughs> so you know maybe I'm not I'm not the right guy for the job. Um, but I am on that other job, so it it does it does tend to. Uh, balance out and, and not, not sting as much. I think also it's very important to have your own thing going. Um, if you are 100% invested in just being a concept artist and that's where you get your fulfillment uh, completely, uh, it's going to be a hard road. It's going to be a very hard road by doing your own projects, going home and continuing to develop your own things. Um, you can put your heart in different things. So you can put a portion of your heart in the concept art and then you go home and, you know, I have, I have projects that I'm developing. I've directed a few things. Um, and there are things that, that really have my, my, my heart. Um, and so that has helped significantly to ease the, um, the pressure of, of getting things approved as a concept artist. I'm working on uh, an animated series that I've had for, for a long time. And just having that has, has really helped me separate uh, myself from the job because you don't have a lot of control as a, as a concept artist. You can create an exciting image that everybody gets behind, but 
you know, a change in the writing can toss it. It doesn't really matter. So it, it, it's a moving target and to try to get all of your emotional fulfillment out of the job uh, is probably a foolish pursuit. The other mm -hmm. thing you can do is change your mentality. So I've, on some shows, uh, I was on one show recently, I can't, I can't say the name of the show. Uh, I wanna say I was on it for six, seven months trying to figure out uh, what these damn monsters are going to be. It's a big show and the director was taking us in all of these directions um, and it wasn't right in and, and, you know, every pass and I would do things that uh, they would like and then they'd realize that's not the direction. So, so it was that for six months. And I got to a point, I was, I was working on it with a very talented uh, other artist uh, by the name of Tully Summers, good friend. Uh, and I often sit next to him uh, on a lot of projects. <laughs> and, uh, and I got to a point where I realized it was a moving target. And I just told myself, I have all these monsters in my head. I'm just going to use this as an opportunity to build a new creature portfolio. You know, if they pick something. That's great. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. If not, I'm going to stay passionate about this because it's so blue sky, uh, I can do whatever the hell I want. So now, and nothing got approved. Nothing, nothing I did got approved. Some, some, they brought another artist on. Uh, he threw a crazy curveball that um, that no one no one told him to do. No one put him in that direction. He just tried this wacky thing, and that's what they ended up going with. Um, and he got it. And, and you know, good for him. Very talented guy. Um, and uh, <laughs> at the end of it, I still look at all of this creature work that I did, these, these like tons of resolved creature models, uh, all of these ideas that have been stuck in my head. And I just cannot wait till the movie comes out and I can post them because mm -hmm. not only were they not right for the film, but they're not right for any film. So it, it's, it was getting paid to, uh, to do my own thing. And that was, that was really fun. So I will go to the movie, I'll watch it. Uh, nothing I, I, I did will be on screen. There's no way. Um, and I will have fond memories of that experience because I finally got all these crazy ideas out of my head. And the other thing, I, at least the way that I work, is that um, I, get, I get stuck on ideas that I have. And if it doesn't make it on screen, then I'll try the ideas on other shows. Um, but if I put it out there, then I usually... I'm not able to uh, to repeat it. So by by just dumping the work out into the world, uh, I'm kind of cleansing my palate. And when I when I sit down to do a design, I'm like, okay, got to do something different. And that, that was something that I actually learned from um, uh, George Carlin because he would he would never do the same material every year. He'd come out with a new thing, and he just like mm -hmm. scrapped old. And that was that was bizarre for comics to do um, back then. But it, it keeps you going. It keeps you um, it keeps you pushing yourself. And that's that's uh, that's very important to do. If you can honestly challenge yourself every single day, uh, you will improve. I don't. I know I don't. I try, but it, it's a it's a very very hard thing to do to challenge yourself yeah. every day. Well, thank you for unpacking that. I mean, if you don't yeah. mind the the reflection. Um, I got three really amazing takeaways from, from what you explained to us. I mean, number one, don't isolate yourself as an artist. If you, if you want to be the kind of artist that works in something that is collaborative by nature, you know, and that is communicative by nature, show your work to other people, you know, develop the courage to be able to share your work and enjoy the positive feedback, but also learn from the negative feedback. Um, you know, the other one, was you know uh, the the last thing you touched on, which I think is an amazing superpower, is that whole idea of changing your mindset. Mm -hmm. um, I was just not too long ago talking with Ian McKaig about the same thing, as he was talking about you know you get it you get a project that for whatever reason it's not hitting the target for you, just change the target, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and get get what you need to get out of that, mm -hmm. um, you know, which I think is so important that we can be isolated as artists. And as a result, you know, then showing your work to another person can be incredibly scary, but learning to do that at a young age. So, you know, I mean, if you're out there and you're even 
um, in high school and you're aspiring to this to this world, like be okay with sharing your artwork and yeah. uh, and and actually critique. I love hearing when I when I haven't quite achieved what I was aiming at. I love that because mm -hmm. now I've immediately got ammunition to approve, you know, mm -hmm. to get better. Yeah. Well, you're more better than I am because when I'm told I don't hit the mark, I'm, I'm still a well, little better. It yeah. always has an impact. You know, I, yeah. I shouldn't sound like it doesn't bother me either. But yeah. um, so let's move from some of the challenges, I think, of of what you do to, um, you know, some some of the rewards. You know, we, we talked about this before the stream, but I'm just going to want to bring up um, Batman here because uh, this was this, you know, getting to work on Batman was was a pretty important thing for you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about that a bit on the on the stream. Um, yeah, Batman. When I first got into comics, when I was a kid, they were actually horror comics. Uh, so I was I was a big EC fan, and um, so that's Tales from the Crypt, Vault of Horror, Haunted Fear. Yeah, that was 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 incredible. So that's what actually got me into comics. And then uh, the Batman animated series came out, and you know my experience with Batman was, of course, you know the you know the Tim Burton film, and then. Um, and then they had a West show. So I was, I was a little on the fence with Batman, but then that version of Batman, I was, I was hooked. So as a kid, you know, watching the animated series, uh, then started collecting the comics and, you know, being, being, you know, a child can be very, um, very tricky at times. You're not you know, completely control of your life and you just have to like go to this institution and sit through classes that you don't like, or, you know, your parents are weird or whatever. Um, <laughs> but I, had, I had Batman. And so Batman played a big influence in my life as a child. And uh, suddenly Batman versus Superman rolls around and I get the call. Uh, and, you know, I, I wouldn't dare uh, for some reason, I, I would never, I've never drawn Batman before this. I never, I never did cons. Um, I never did fan art um, because I always had my own ideas. Uh, I didn't want to spend the time on other characters, but I was always very passionate uh, about Batman. So when I finally had the opportunity to work on these suits, uh, I was just, I jumped at it. Um, and uh, I worked with costume designer, Michael Wilkinson. And um, uh, I remember, I remember just being so uh, driven and focused. Um, I was working with, a lot of good friends, actually, uh, on Batman versus Superman. I was working with uh, my friend Constantine Securis and Keith Christensen, and um, it'll come to me. Oh my God, he's such a nice guy. What is wrong with me? Warren Manser. Ugh, I don't know how that slipped my head. Um, Warren Manser is an is, is an incredible uh, concept artist, and he has a lot of history in uh, superhero suits. He, he worked on um, uh, the first, you know, Sam Raimi Spider-Man suit. Oh yeah, okay. Like, like I don't know why I slipped on that one, but um, uh, suddenly I'm in this room, and this is earlier on in my uh, career. I didn't have a lot of wins, um, and uh, they put uh, they put me and my buddy Constantine Securis on Batman, and Constantine did some cool options. I did some cool options, and then. Eventually, uh, you know, other artists came in, and that was that was my first uh, time where I had to I had to really push myself in order to stay on the on the characters because all these guys had more experience than me and they were all better than me. Um, but somehow, uh, what I did resonated with the uh, director, and I got I got Batman, and um, that was pretty trippy on the on the first show. So I got to do Batman uh, with the costume designer. And uh, it was it was probably the most rewarding experience of my career um, to, to such an extent that everything after Batman was uh, was not Batman. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, I, and I love I love your shout out to the uh, animated series because in this okay. particular image, when I was going through your portfolio, this yeah. this one on on the side here, the silhouette to me anyway is straight up. Oh, uh, Batman the animated series. Yeah, that, that's opening credits. He he yeah. lands on the roof, comes up, and he's just a silhouette. Yeah, yeah. Sorry uh, to interrupt. I just had to geek out on that for a oh, second. Yeah, of course. And you know, uh, my favorite comics too. Like like the the animated series really seemed to be uh, Dark Knight Returns Batman uh, from the beginning. You know what I mean? Like you could see that Batman 
becoming Dark Knight Returns, uh, you know, Frank Miller. So there are a lot of amazing moments. I mean, and this past was before, you know, uh, Affleck was cast. So I was just like trying to figure out, you know, uh, what it would be or who it would be. So it was just kind of like a generic, um, generic faces. But, uh, but yeah, to, to be able to do that version and to finally get the note from, from Snyder that uh, we're going in that Dark Knight Returns realm, like I, I couldn't have been more uh, fulfilled. I was getting married at the time too. My wife was very wow. understanding and, and let me, let me uh, uh, spend a lot of time. She planned our entire wedding um, and, uh, and, and just let me, let me do this. Um, and it ended up being, being really worth it. Um, I was able to get a, get a, get some good attention from this project and you know, it, it is a domino effect. Um, you know, a career is genuinely something that you build. Uh, so it is just, uh, you know, each step is just one success after the other and um, you know, trying to see how, how high you can climb. And so, you know, Batman was a big, was a big step. Um, and so the only other time I've been this artistically fulfilled, I think was, uh, was Avengers and, um, and Justice League. And Justice League was a very strange and wonderful experience as well, because I had, I had earned some level of uh, trust <laughs> on, on Justice League. So the costume designer, Michael Wilkinson, uh, was throwing more characters at me. And uh, we started with another team. Uh, we brought back uh, Constantine Securis. Uh, 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 I ended up recommending Phil Bette and good, a good friend, Ian Joyner, who had spent mm -hmm. uh, the majority of his time at Legacy Effects. But at this point you know, on Justice League, I had I had become more and more and more of a ZBrush artist. And so uh, Wilkinson wanted another 3D guy, a guy who could handle really complicated stuff. And I instantly thought of, of Ian Joyner, who had who was starting to venture away from uh, legacy into freelance work. And, you know, he was a great fit. Um, so we, we were on that show for a while. And then uh, the way a lot of shows actually go is um, they'll start in they'll start in the United States and then uh, when they get closer to shooting, if they're going to shoot overseas, the whole thing goes overseas. So they'll start the design process and they'll just cut everybody, and then the design process will continue. Um, and in this case, it continued in in London, but uh, they took me with them. Wow! Yeah, so that was that was incredible, and, uh, <laughs> and I've, I've, I've said it before. But so that happens a lot. Like, you know, American artists will work really hard and the next thing you know, it just disappears to the UK and you can't help but have a little bit of resentment. And so, you know, they're flying me out and I get to meet all of these artists who've taken, you know, uh, projects that have started in the, U in the United States and I'm just ready to, to not like them. And then, of course, <laughs> they're the sweetest, most wonderful people I've ever uh, worked with. Uh, the three in particular, uh, Mark Trunk, Andrew Hodgson's and uh, Brooke uh, Dibble. Uh, they were they were really wonderful, and uh, I really I really liked working um, with them. They were they were incredible, very humble. There's also a different um, very different mentality in working uh, overseas, um, and uh, they, they were just very wonderful and and uh, and actually very patient with me. <laughs> That's great. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I ended up I ended up tackling a lot of these characters, um, and they all they all most of them went through me at at, uh, at one point. They kept me on Batman. Wilkinson kept me on Batman for a long time, but he also kept me on Cyborg because <clears throat> at the time uh, he felt that that I was the most familiar with ZBrush and and could tackle it. Ian Joyner could have definitely tackled it, but. Um, but he put him on uh, uh, Aquaman armor and and Flash stuff, which was that was an ordeal. Like like Ian Ian powered through that like a champ, and then of course it got uh, refined when we went uh, to the UK with their with their team. Uh, so it was crazy. A lot of that those suits were built, you know, in ZBrush. Um, so it was it was an awesome project. And now with the Snyder Cut, 
soon to come out. A lot of the other characters that I worked on uh, will make it on screen. So I'm oh, very cool. excited about that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, and you've worked on so many amazing projects. Um, as I've gone through the list, I mean, just really, you know, one really cool project after the other. And I'm sure that's that's not the entire list. And, you know, some projects are more fun than others. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to, before we get to some questions from the chat, um, you know, you you taught for a number of years at Nomen. Um, mm -hmm. I've had the great pleasure of being in class with both uh, Jared Krzyzewski, um, Kyle Brown, who are both students of yours. Yeah. Uh, they're teaching today at the school. Um, what was your time at Nomen like? It was it was crazy. Uh, it was really fun. Um, I used to teach two classes on the weekend, uh, and I, when I first started at Nomen, I was actually taking over uh, half a class from my friend Hong Lee, uh, who I, I worked with at NCSOC. Hong was actually one of my uh, early character design teachers from Associates in Art, and we ended up reconnecting when I saw him at uh, Art Center, and then he called me to uh, to help him out with his uh, his Nomen class. And then eventually I took over his class. And I think I was teaching at Nomen for eight or nine years, uh, two classes. My voice uh, would give out, I remember, because it was like three hours each. And selfishly, one of the best things about teaching is learning your process, uh, because you have to know your process in order to break it down into stages and give people things that they can they can work with, things that are more tangible, because all of concept art from the surface seems intangible. But, you know, no matter how complicated an image is, there were very uh, simple ways of getting there. Um, so having to learn my own process and break it down in such a way that I could communicate it with students was invaluable. Like, I, you know, selfishly, that was, that was wonderful. Um, outside of that, uh, being able to uh, teach students that were passionate uh, was was incredibly rewarding. Um, and there were so many students in my class that I was just able to uh, bring into the industry. And that too really, really got me. Um, it, it actually really excited me to uh, get students from the classroom into a career path, uh, and I, I didn't know I didn't know I would even care about that. I, I but you know, whatever. Uh, the funny thing is, Krzyzewski specifically, he was he was my first, <laughs> and um, he was so alert and so focused in my class. He's like such a nice guy. Uh, uh, I actually expected part of that personality to kind of go away the longer I knew him, but he's still, you know, he's still just bubbly and eager and, and um, you know, ready to learn regardless of how, how accomplished he, he'd become. So my, my best moment teaching was actually with uh, Krzyzewski. So I was, I was working at a visual effects company that, that would focus on design for a while. And uh, I had the idea of bringing in Nomen students, uh, because we were getting a, a lot of work and I decided, you know, that I would just kind of like recruit from my, from my class. And, uh, you know, I, I, not only do I teach the, um, you know, character and creature design, but I also teach as much as I can about the business because I don't want there to be any mystery about it. I want it to be as tangible and as real as it possibly can be so that students can form a plan and, and, and build a career. So it's not, it's not about, you know, you know, the magic of it it's about breaking through getting get it getting uh sure thing. Yeah. whatever and so one day I, i've been talking about that for a while about like jumping at our opportunities and stuff like that and just to see if anybody was awake while i was lecturing because <laughs> i tend to ramble uh i said oh by the way there's an internship available at my uh at, at, at my uh at my job is anybody interested krzyzewski's hand shot up <laughs> or before the words were even processed by anyone else. And I was like, okay, cool, you. <laughs> and that was, nice. nice. That was it. And I think that that was a great moment um, for a lot of the people in that room because there was an opportunity. Uh, there was one spot available. And I kind of, I kind of knew Jared was paying attention. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have been, that could have been disastrous with someone else. Uh, and uh, and it's like oh wow you really have to jump at those those chances so 
Uh, the only regret I had, actually, when Jared brought his hand up, was just like, ah, well, I mean, he deserves it, but, you know, it's going to be another Jared in the office, and so they're going <laughs> to... That could get confusing. Like, that was the only that was the only down, downside. And, you know, Jared, um, he, he grew, like, every... Every day, he didn't say no to anything. Like uh, no ego, he just he just got stuff done. And um, you know, I wasn't I wasn't in charge really. I was just I was just facilitating him getting getting through the door. So I mean, he was he was able to make the most of it. And so Jared's a really solid uh, success story. He's also one of the uh, few students that I've had who has grown the most. Uh, you know, I, I, he, he didn't have that much going in to it. Um, but man, he hit the ground running and he just, every time I see his work, it's just, it, it, it's incredible. So to go from student to coworker, you know, I've had, I've had that experience a couple of times with, um, mm -hmm. with, uh, another guy, Kel Cran, who's, who's working like crazy. Um, Josh Herman, who I take, I take no credit for his development as an artist because I barely, like I said, he was a very quiet guy in my class. <laughs> um, so I don't know if I had any influence over him. Um, but yet to, to, to give people the opportunities, uh, was, that, that was, that was really fun. Now that I'm, you know, on bigger shows that, that doesn't, that option doesn't, that opportunity doesn't, doesn't come up very much where they're like. Like, oh, do you know, you know, right. up and coming artists? It's not that. It's just like, do you know someone who can just knock this out of the park and hit the ground running and, you know, a seasoned professional that's available? So I don't, I don't get that opportunity anymore to, uh, to, to bring people in, which is kind of, kind of a shame. But, uh, but I did, I did have fond memories of that. And, uh, and teaching at Noman was, was a wonderful experience. Well, and I love the story about Jared on, at Krzyzewski. It's funny because we always, I mean, at least I always say his last name and yeah. I always say your last name when I'm at Noman because people often, they, don't, they won't know which Jared you're talking about. Um, but, uh, you know, it, and it's great to hear that because, you know, he hasn't changed. As, a, as an instructor, he's, he's one of the coolest instructors. Uh, both him and Kyle are, are incredibly engaging. Um, really humble and like as an instructor, they don't they don't dominate you as a student. They mm -hmm. guide you, but um, they they want to hear your thoughts and ideas. Um, but I love also the fact that you know this happened with you, but it also has happened with other instructors at Noman. Is if you get into a class at Noman and you make a really good impression on your instructor, if mm -hmm. an opportunity comes up that they think that you can take, um, it's it it happens from time to time that students just find their way yeah. into a studio or into a project. Um, mm -hmm. So in that in that sense, I like because people always ask me about internships. I like to say, well, just being with being in Noman classes, you're like in a bunch of little mini internships because you're already connected to to the yeah. industry, you're already connected to to a studio. Um, yeah. That's what was so good about uh, as I mentioned before, associates in art when I was a kid. Like that's how I I broke in. I got it. I got the right attention, and then someone got me an internship at a practical effects house. So uh, those environments where you're actually being taught by industry professionals, like that is the starting line, you know. And um, I, I do tell students and and uh, and hope that students really take advantage of that scenario because uh, a lot of students I don't think realize that no, your foot is in the door right now. So, yep. Yeah, be on your best behavior and uh, work really hard, and and you know the next step is is right within reach. Like it's it's incredible. Yeah. Well, I it, and uh, you know one of the things I wanted to to talk with you about was you know what kind of thoughts and advice you have for for younger artists. But I feel like we've actually covered quite a bit of that um, just through your story. Um, so I'd like to now transition to taking some questions from the chat. Um, my colleague Xander is currently moderating um, the the chats on all all three of our streaming platforms for those of you in uh, Facebook and YouTube as well as Twitch, and he's um, feeding questions through to me uh, to bring up to Jared. So if you haven't asked a question yet, please you know feel free to jump in, type your questions in the chat. Um, there are a few that I see listed here that we've actually already already answered in context of the conversation. So I'll jump on the ones that doesn't seem we've gotten to yet. But let's see here. I'm just gonna I'm just looking at the list right now for the first time. Um, 
okay, so this this is a more of a, a higher altitude question, um, you know, and maybe you wanna you wanna touch on an aspect you haven't mentioned already. Uh, what advice would you give to an aspiring artist looking to get into character design specifically? Figure drawing, yep. tons and tons and tons of, of figure drawing. Um, I think one of the mistakes people make is, especially nowadays, because concept art is everywhere. It's important to look at the artist that. Uh, you admire, um, but it's even more important to build your foundation and draw every single day. So figure drawing is actually uh, totally within your grasp. I mean, aside from taking a sketchbook and buying sketchbooks and just having the uh, tools accessible all the time is a big deal. So buy small sketchbooks, um, start working with uh, more more. Um, portable mediums like ballpoint pens, whatever, an iPad and, 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 a, and a pen is, is a great tool as well. And draw everything you see. You know, I would say, I would say go out to a cafe, but that's, that's a rarity. Uh, <laughs> but when the world gets back to normal, yeah, go out, draw, draw everything you see. Um, figure drawing is incredibly accessible. You can actually find pose sets on YouTube and, right. uh, those are timed, which is really good because the way that figure drawing classes are structured is um, you'll start with like 10 second gesture drawings, 10 to 30 seconds, and then you know it slows down, then you'll have five minutes, and then you might get 10 minutes on a drawing. Um, and you should be doing that all the time. So once, once you get a good grasp on uh, the nude figure, then you go into the draped figure and you draw as much of that uh, as, as humanly possible. You can also do uh, a lot of grayscale studies. So artists who are on the top of their game, like uh, you know Ryan Minerding, Charlie Wen, uh, they spent a lot of time working in grayscale and staining with color in Photoshop. Uh, and so you know, artists like, like, like Ryan, for example, will do quite a bit of observational drawing because they have to get the likeness of their actor um, before they ever, you know, put a costume on them. So doing studies of portraits where, you know, you bring um, that, that portrait into Photoshop, you open up a document next to it, and in grayscale, uh, you copy it. Uh, that's, that's essential um, when it comes to character design and, uh, and costume. So it's, it's a lot of drawing for, for forever. Uh, and, and learning, <laughs> learning never stops, even even at my right. stage. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. Like, I have the great fortune of knowing a few of of my heroes, you, you included. Um, you know, who are accomplished uh, designers, especially the characters, and even those that are you know on top of their game and are leading the industry, whether that's game or film, uh, they're still figure drawing. You know, yeah. like, you know, there's guys that I follow and and they're out there and I, I just had another figure drawing session. It was so fun. So it's like they're addicted to the process. They're addicted to yeah. the to the learning, to using that muscle memory. Um, and, I, and I will say also another great resource is I do know that uh, Gallery Girls L.A. Uh, and they they have have done regular events on the Noman soundstage for live figure drawing, costume figure drawing. Um, I know that they've been doing some streaming as well, some streamed events. So if you want to research them, uh, that's a great way to do some almost live figure drawing uh, while we're currently in quarantine. Um, so we got another uh, another viewer who's just saying, hi, hi, Jared, I'm a big fan. Um, they're curious to know if you have any sort of online mentoring or if you have any you know, learning resources uh, that you've made available from, from you. And I know we talked about uh, uh, the alien outlaws on Gumroad mm -hmm. earlier. Yeah. Any, any, any other things? Uh, yeah, I do. Well, I do want to release more uh, very affordable little videos like like Alien Outlaws. Uh, it's always it's always a time uh, issue, but I'm still very proud of my uh, Noman uh, workshop uh, designing the Alien Rock Rubber, where I go through right. the entire process of designing the character in 2D to uh, fully resolving the model in ZBrush, uh, and that one that one still holds up. Um, some of the technology has been updated, but it's still it's still very relevant. Like um, like with with Keyshot and ZBrush with the bridge, uh, you don't have to UV a model. So I, I UV'd that and brought it into um, Keyshot back in the day, and now with the bridge, it's just like 
click a button and shows up in Keyshot. So I do recommend that if you're into uh, creature modeling. I recommend uh, the Alien um, Outlaws Gumroad for uh, fast ideation and um, and just generating a lot of options, sketching. Uh, yeah, that's about it. As for as for internships, I'm not really set up for that. I've been I tend to stack jobs, so I, I kind of disappear and stay in front of a computer and just do uh, deliverables for shows. I would like to get back to teaching at some point, um, but uh, but it, it may be a while. Well, and, and definitely, uh, and it's interesting, it's, sometimes I'll talk to folks that are more familiar with, with Noman as a school, as a, as a real school um, that's offering college degree, and they aren't as familiar with the Noman workshop or vice versa. People mm -hmm. who are more familiar with the workshop, but yeah, definitely uh, check out um, Jared's because it's what I love about the Noman Workshop is these are deep dives. These yeah. are you know several videos that you can go through, um, and it really is like getting to look over Jared's shoulder and have him talk to you about what he's doing as he's doing it. So um, tremendous! Uh, uh, I, won't, I don't want to call it a tutorial. It's more of a more of a lesson. It's deeper than that. Um, so yeah, check out the Nomen Workshop. It's just a subscription-based system, and you get access to hundreds upon hundreds of videos like Jared's. I think the uh, the uh, rock rubber is like six hours. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, and and most of them are like really long. I'm I'm going right now in the middle of going through um, uh, Maddie Spencer's ZBrush 2020. Oh wow! Um, and I think it's like a nine. Uh, it's a nine video, <laughs> kind of a deep dive. Wow. Um, Does it wow? Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, this is an interesting question. Uh, what what should you expect during an in person interview as a concept artist if you're trying to get a job? Yeah, uh, I haven't been on one in a very long time. Um, <coughs> uh, well, in person interview. Well, if you have an in person interview, uh, that's that's pretty good. That means you got through uh, the first round and they're interested in you. So uh, they're just feeling out your personality, your willingness to um, work on a team, um, and they're they're just they're just getting to know you. So an in-person interview, you can expect uh, them probably asking you um, about your process and and how you work with other people and and uh, and stuff of that nature. I haven't had that in a while. In um, as a freelance. Uh, concept artists for you know the film or, or game interview um, game stuff. Uh, I very rarely do interviews. Usually, it's just a call for availability, which will happen eventually um, when you're when, when you're I guess on the short list or or in demand. Uh, interviews, I would imagine, happening more at like visual effects houses and um, and video game studios. So that's that's more for a a, a full time position. Than it would be uh, as a as a um, uh, freelance scenario. Uh, I'm trying to think. The last time I, I had that uh, was the last time I had that was for a video game. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's exactly what they they just wanted to make sure I was I was fun because they're essentially looking to to you know hire a roommate. So be on your best behavior. Uh, be kind, be um, be accommodating, and then try to maintain that while, while you're on the job. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've heard uh, uh, Josh Herman say exactly the same thing. He yeah. said, if, if you've made it to the in-person video or interview, it means they've already seen your portfolio, they like what they've seen, now they wanna interview the person. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. All right, so we've got another uh, viewer who's asking um, specifically about you know portfolio for concept artists. Um, mm -hmm. For someone wanting to break into the industry today um, mm -hmm. and is getting their portfolio out there, uh, what are some types of things that you would suggest would be important for them to have in their portfolio? It really depends on what uh, type of work you want to do. A portfolio is an, is an amazing tool, and it's not just um, you know a a, a a book full of examples of what you can provide for a client. You can actually sculpt your career with a portfolio. Um, so first step is, is just, you know, knowing exactly what you want to do. And, and that's easy because, uh, it's, it's whatever makes you the most happy. So that's, that's where, uh, I would put the majority of my effort in, in the portfolio. My portfolio was mainly characters and creatures. 
that's been my entire career because I've never really presented myself as anything else. So that is a, a power that you actually have as, as an artist. Um, so it's good not to, not to forget that. Um, the way that I would handle a portfolio is the way that I handled a portfolio. I, I figured out what I wanted to do early on and where I wanted to do it. I either wanted to land a job at um, Rick Baker's or Stan Winston's. And so based on information that I gathered from you know, professionals uh, who are definitely more accessible now <laughs> than they were when I was, when I was doing it, uh, I was able to model my, my portfolio after the jobs that I wanted to, to get. And uh, seamlessly, I ended up getting them just because I uh, showed that I, I excelled at, at those things that I was the most passionate about. Now, was I amazing? No, I was not. Uh, I was good. I was good enough. And uh, a lot of students don't realize or a lot of people realizing don't realize that coming out of school, you do actually have an advantage to uh, employers. So outside of having a good portfolio, uh, coming right out of school makes you kind of attractive because you could be more affordable than a seasoned professional. Um, so I had noticed that, that dropping the fact that I had just graduated uh, from Art Center um, made people very interested because my work was good. You know, again, there were better portfolios, I'm sure, or you know, better people, but um, they knew I was more affordable. And so that was the level of commitment that they uh, were willing to make at the time. So when I had uh, called in to set up my interview at uh, Stan Winston's, and uh, you had to you had to call back then. This is this is like 2005, and I actually got through the door. Um, you know, I had my my portfolio. I brought in a few maquettes, and I was able to get enough attention to get Stan Winston to actually notice me and hire me um, on the spot. Uh, but I had been spending all of this time knowing what they were looking for and building that in my in my book so it was it was it was very focused so what i would recommend is um identify the jobs that you would love to get find out what they're looking for and then that's how you structure your portfolio and your education it's good to have a well-rounded education um but you have to you have to excel at something you have to stand out now more than ever i mean i had a conversation with uh, a friend recently anthony francisco very talented in-house artist over at, at marvel um just wondering what it would be like to actually start today instead of uh 15 years ago where the industry was a much smaller before you know noman had a huge presence before art station and uh concept art uh, um, I forgot the name of the other one that went down. Yeah, there was uh, concept art, and then the another one that stuck around that's been around for a long time is uh, Deviant Art. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, it's it, you know, concept art got close to you know being the beast that Art Station is, but now that everything is so accessible, like like man, you really have to ask yourself, what are you the most passionate about doing, and how do I stand out? Um, and the first step is, of course, to just get your foot through the door somewhere. So you might have to take a hit on, on rate, um, but that's how you build. You know, that's how you take that next step. You did a project. It went well. You develop some relationships and you jump on to, um, to the next project. If you're doing the freelance thing, if you're trying to land an in-house job, um, getting the foot through the door is, you know, step one, contact, you know, their human relations. Is that what they're called? I don't know. They're recruiters and and try to submit uh, artwork. And that, when you're unemployed, that's your job. You know, if, if you are looking for artwork, that, for, for, for work, that, that's what you do. That, that is constantly your job. Um, and then eventually you'll get to a point if you if you really worked very hard and you've challenged yourself every day where you just get calls, which is really nice. And you can kind of pick and choose and, and, and schedule. Uh, but it takes years. It takes a very, very, um, very long time. You just uh, actually took a really wide swing at like several questions we've got in the chat at once. That was awesome. <laughs> um, because I think you've also, you also touched on opportunity as well, which I know there's a lot of questions out there. Mm -hmm. Character artists are, you know, so many people want to be character artists. 
yeah. our character designers that, um, you know, it, it can be more competitive, it can be challenging. Um, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd also, if I may, I could, I'd also throw in like, don't be afraid of looking to um, other, other types of production. Like I know that in like right now in toy production, um, yeah. those are all, those are all characters primarily. Um, and they're leaning more into bringing in ZBrush artists and they're leaning more into like borrowing from the entertainment industry and saying, Hey, if they've got great designers there, why shouldn't we have great designers here? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, there's also those sideways lateral opportunities that are out there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like at uh, gentle giant, there were some artists that made that transition into design. Um, but yeah, it's all, it's all figurative art. They're all uh, skills that can be used. So even if you're at a job um, that isn't your end, end goal, uh, you got to go home and you got to keep working on your portfolio. The reason why some people succeed and other people uh, don't is is drive. It really is. Um, I think that's the difference between artists, essentially. It's just how far you push yourself. I'm not, I, I've been in the debate of, of um, the talent and gifted conversation for a while because I know everything that it took to get to where I currently am. And it didn't seem like a gift. Um, it didn't seem like something was handed uh, to me. And, and the stories that I've heard from other artists, it doesn't seem like it was handed to them. It was just countless hours of, um, you know, refining your craft, putting in the time and getting better. Um, so uh, if you're not getting those calls, if you're not, if you're not employable at the time, um, always look at your portfolio first, always look at your skill set first. If there, there should be no mystery why you're not getting work. Um, if you're, if your portfolio is not exciting, then you, your job is just to get better, get better, get better all the time. Um, if your portfolio is exciting, then there's something wrong with your personality and you can work on that. Um, but, uh, but I find that concept art is a very uh, honest career path. It, it's, it's been, in my experience, very fair. Um, which is a weird is a weird thing to say through my limited experience, uh, especially in these times. But uh, regardless of, of gender and race, um, it's the portfolio. And if you are exceptional and if you're really good, um, you will get work. You know, it, it is it is uh, always it, it has always seemed that simple to me. Um, but again, it's through my, through my limited understanding of the, of the situation. Anytime I've ever come across an artist that has felt uh, slighted or has, has felt that um, uh, they're not getting the opportunities or they're not uh, getting compensated the way that they feel. Um, I mean, that, that, that resonates with me. And so I'm always, always very curious and I will, I will, I will look up their, their, portfolio look at their art station or whatever and then there is absolutely no mystery it's just like there is a reason why you're not making um what you want to be making is because you have not earned it like are you is your portfolio at the same level of the people who are you know earning that and uh i have not seen an instance yet um where there is an exceptional artist who is not making uh what other exceptional artists are making, um, unless they don't know how to ask for it. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I have not, I haven't, I haven't seen that yet. So we'll, we'll see. That's a touchy subject, but, but, that sure. is, but it, it, these days it, it has, it has come up quite a bit and, uh, I haven't, I haven't seen an instance on, 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 you know, my side, my, my, my side of the industry. I'm sure there are, um, there are, but I, I have yet to see someone who is uh, absolutely exceptional um, complaining about not having the opportunities or, or being compensated for I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Well, and I, and I love, you know, what you, what you touched on earlier as well is that that idea of being exceptional is not a magic wand. No. Uh, you know, whether you want to call that magic wand talent um, or, you know, whatever you're going to name it, uh, we just did a, a interview with uh, Max Dayan last week, mm -hmm. and you know he was saying that a lot of times behind that question of talent, sometimes is just really sometimes p 
people want to know, is there a way that it can be easy for me? Um, mm -hmm. But what I'm hearing you say is, you know, the exceptional ones, every single one of them have worked incredibly hard. Um, and if it's what you want to do, you're going to want to work hard at it. Um, and, and I also, yeah. It's always, it's always, <laughs> I, I, I'll, it gets, it can be less hard at times, but I've noticed even, even recently, I'm like, ah, oh, this is still 20 years. This is still pretty challenging, actually. It doesn't go away. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I think I'll, I'll end on a little bit more of a playful note because um, I realize we're at time and I want to be respectful of your time, Jared. Uh, one, one question came up in the chat. Um, is there anything, are there any projects or types of projects that you've not worked on yet that you would really like to? Is there anything left on the bucket list as it were? My own stuff. Mm. Yeah, my own stuff would be. Well, and you, you're you also, um, you've been doing some directing as well. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I finished uh, my first, first short film uh, mm -hmm. called Shelter uh, with, my, with my wife. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll do the 48-hour film festival occasionally, but that first film uh, was, was really good uh, to do. Um, it's an adequate first film. <laughs> uh, it was an it was incredible learning experience. I am... I am proud of it. It is it is an accomplishment to just uh, have done it. There's so many people in our industry who are uh, capable and um, aren't able to actually get you know their first film made. So I am I am proud of that. Uh, now I just have to do you know a second, a third, a fourth. I have to just keep keep going and building on that momentum while you know juggling these awesome jobs and, and you know supporting a family. So it's uh, it is a challenge. So I would I would say that. Um, you know, my ambitions are, are more pushing my own stuff. And on a side note, uh, I do recommend that anyone pursuing concept art actually uh, uh, try filmmaking, try writing, try directing. Um, it will make you a better concept artist because as a concept artist, you are responsible for a portion of the story, uh, for supporting the story. So if you understand storytelling, you are more likely to be able to do that job uh, better um, if you actually understand what role your assignment plays in the overall film. So writing, directing, um, understanding storytelling will make you a better designer, uh, no doubt. Awesome. Jared, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm going to go back and watch this stream, uh, even though I was the one doing the interview, um, because there's a lot, there's so many good nuggets in this, um, some tremendous artwork. Uh, but thank you for letting us take an hour and a half with you just just to, to listen to your story, to listen to, um, you know, you reflecting on what you've learned and sharing that knowledge with us. It's, it's invaluable. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's always fun. I, uh, you know, I've been quarantined and isolated for, for a lot of time. So to just have a conversation, <laughs> yes. with, uh, you know, people who are not immediate members of my family, it's been nice. <laughs> I completely understand that point. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm in the same place. Well, uh, thank you again. Um, we're guys, we're going to get ready to uh, transition to, I, I want to talk to you for about, uh, for, for about 30 minutes or so about Nomen and how we're training artists. Um, but it's always important to us to be able to lead, with an amazing conversation with an artist uh, like like Jared to provide context to provide you know what what why what are the whys and then we'll we'll talk about the how afterwards so Jared thank you for taking time with us um, we'll definitely be in touch and yeah. Um, yeah hopefully see you again in the near future thank you so much yeah it's been fun awesome thank you all right so I'm gonna do just a little bit of screen juggling here moving from one presentation to another um, and let's see here. Let's take that and let's start this up. Bear with me, guys. Sometimes you just got to juggle a little bit to get everything ready. Um, but with that, we are good to go. So, um, yeah, talking about Nomen, um, I will start off by saying that, you know, this we are a school that's been around for quite a while. We were actually started uh, back in 1997 by a creature artist by the name of Alex Alvarez. Um, and Alex uh, is an artist who's worked in the industry, and he started Nomen as a place for uh, industry artists to come and train in what we teach. Um, and uh, so in that sense, we we're kind of born in the industry, 
and we've grown uh, very rapidly into being a publicly facing school where people can come and learn the same things. Um, so moving forward, uh, just to mention that, you know, we've not only been around for more than 20 years, but in that time, we've, we've won a lot of really great awards. For instance, the awards that you see here with little R's above them, these are known as the rookies. All the top schools in the world compete, and we've ranked uh, number one worldwide uh, a couple of times. Uh, actually, no, I think we just ranked for a third time <laughs> this year. Uh, it's recent news. Um, so just to give you an idea, you know, we've been around for more than two decades, and we're very good at what we do. And um, because of that, our artists are going on to work on some amazing projects. So for example, um, the project posters you see on the screen in front of you, these are just some of the projects that um, our alumni have worked on. These are, these are projects that all graduates from Noman have gone on to work on. And uh, these are some of the studios that are out there that you might recognize who are regularly hiring uh, graduates from our full-time programs at Noman. Um, I'd like to say at this point, you know, that we have been able to maintain a very high placement rate over the years. Just last year in 2019, we had a 97% placement rate. The year before that in 2018, 100%. And that is the percentage of graduates from our full-time programs who are finding work in the industry, in studio, doing what they trained to do within six months of finishing our program. And a lot of them uh, much, much sooner than six months. Um, so, you know, that's, that really, uh, to me, is one of the most important things to communicate about what Noman is doing. We are not just interested in teaching you the technical skills uh, behind the art or behind, you know, what it is you're going to be doing. We also want to make you ready for the industry so that you can go out there and acquire that first job and break into the industry um, after you finish your education. So next up, I want to share with you just a short, uh, few short clips of three different industry artists who are all graduates of Noman uh, talking about their experience here at our school. One, oh, apologies, someone recommended yes, there we go. me checking out Noman. Uh, I didn't know actually anything about it. Uh, I first found the tutorials and so I applied. I got in and it was the best decision of my life. I'm uh, Kirsten England uh, and I'm a technical visual effects artist at Naughty Dog. I originally was uh, part of their foreground department in 2015. Uh, I was still in school. I'm originally from Ohio. Um, I grew up in a pretty small town there uh, called Milan. Uh, yeah, we came out here and visited the school and uh, got a tour. Uh, just walking through like the sculpture lab here and everything and uh yeah it was just amazing and i was like wow i, I really got to go here uh, my name is tyler bulliard um, i'm currently a look development artist at walt disney animation studios i started there in the talent development program as a trainee uh, on zootopia actually uh, and then i've worked on every film since then it's it's funny to think that like 10 years ago you know i was working at target and you know paying my way through nomen and I, my name's uh Jay Machado, I'm a senior hard surface modeler at Industrial Light and Magic, and I've been there for about five years. Worked on a few things there, uh, Transformers 4, uh, Episode 7, Rogue One. Uh, everyone I graduated with within you know a month or two was working somewhere in the industry. Always love hearing from our alumni. Um, and I would actually encourage you, if you're interested in Noman, to research who some of our alumni are. Uh, look at the projects that they worked on. Um, look at what their careers looked like after finishing school with us. Um, so just moving past that, what did these, so for example, these three artists we heard from, what did they learn during their time at Noman? Um, in one term, in sort of a catch-all term, uh, it's called digital production. Now, digital production is going to include the following uh, disciplines and skills. These are things like computer-based visual effects, character and creature design, which we were actually just talking with Jared Morantz about today, uh, digital sculpting, character and creature animation, environment design, uh, lighting and rendering, matte painting and compositing, game asset creation, game engines, production workflows, and world building. Um, now, all these skills translate into the following careers. So each, each one of the uh, positions that's coming up on the screen here, these are all uh, unique positions within the digital production pipeline, whether we're talking about a film uh, or a game or a television program. Um, and each one of these are uh, very, very unique. And uh, actually, 
have very unique skill sets, very unique type of things that they do, and provide room for a lot of different kinds of artists. So I wanted to take a moment and just go through four of these uh, as examples for you, um, where you know to to show you that there's there's different ways that different kinds of artists can fit into the industry, and there are usually there's a lot more kinds of roles out there often than we're aware of. So uh, moving forward, we're going to take a look at character artists. Um, and uh, I actually believe that this is, yep, these are, this is uh, some clips from Jared Morantz's Noman workshop uh, on uh, designing the alien rock rubber. So the, the workshop he's talking about in our interview, this is a sampling of it. And it's a great, fantastic example of what a character or creature artist does. Um, so here, Jared is using a software ZBrush, um, which we spoke about. And this is a fantastic piece of software because it allows you to use traditional sculpting techniques um, with virtual 3D clay. And consequently, it is the industry standard for sculpting creatures, uh, characters, um, even organic shapes found in nature. Um, great way of executing that. Um, so, you know, as we, as you heard earlier in the stream, uh, a, a creature or character artist is also going to be spending a lot of time drawing and a lot of time, you know, working in a lot of those more traditional um, art, uh, visual art mediums. Um, and so this is a great example of a career path and a job in the pipeline that is, is leaning much, very much towards that type of an artist. Next up, we have uh, effects artists. And um, VFX artists, um, I like to say, for example, as we're seeing here, these are artists that get to sit in front of their computer all day and blow things up. Um, that is that is a large portion of the job. And because they're creating very complex sequences like these, um, you can't go in and animate each individual particle um, or piece of debris that's moving about. You can't animate each one by hand like you would say for a character or a creature. Instead, these artists are using specialized software that is driving simulations of real world physics, things like water, fire, uh, you know, gravity, plasma, weightlessness, you know, you name it. Um, so they are driving these physics engines with the software that they use to create animation that looks believable. For example, how would a space station of a particular mass and velocity break apart um, when being hit by debris? What would that look like? And these are the artists that are creating those simulations. So it's a great example of a career where you are creating amazing visual sequences, but you're also doing things in a way that might be also a little bit more technically oriented. Uh, these are artists that are very curious about the world around them. They're always looking at the way things are, are happening and they're observing uh, those natural properties and then imagining how they can drive that as a simulation uh, for an effect in a film um, or a TV program, for example. Um, they're also using a little bit of coding from time to time um, in the pipeline. So, you know, uh, sometimes uh, artists who are very interested in coding and computer science but want to do something more visually oriented, want a different kind of an output, uh, they often can find their way into this arena as well. So next up are compositors. Uh, now, compositors are generally more towards the end of the digital production pipeline. And that is because they are the artists that they don't necessarily create all of the components, whether it's 3D models or animation or video and so forth, but they bring all those assets together. They're the person who knows how to weave them together into one scene. So here, for instance, the background of tennis court are 3D models. The uh, tennis players are actors in front of green screens. The foreground are 3D model buildings with lighting and rendering, um, as well as um, surface painting and so forth. Additional actors are inserted. A final lighting pass is done, and you wind up with a scene like this. And this is what's known as an establishing shot in film. Uh, we see these all the time. This is the director's way of being able to let us know this is the location that we are at now. This is where the story is taking place. And um, you know, instead of having to go out and find a real world location uh, that fits perfectly with the story and hire actors and film crews and get permission to film there and purchase the insurance necessary, instead now uh, directors can go to a VFX house and they could say, hey, these are the establishing shots I need for my story. And then all of their, you know, um, uh, modelers and 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 when I go together and create all of the assets, but then the compositor is the person that receives all of those those assets um, from the rest of the pipeline and weaves it together into a scene that, honestly, you know, I know uh, VFX supervisors that will tell you, you know, that uh, uh, sometimes it's very hard to tell <laughs> whether a shot like that is real world or done um, with compositing, and that's because these artists are doing such an incredible job today. 
Um, so let's go from more towards the end of the digital production pipeline to the beginning. Uh, one of the first things that is going to happen in production is pre-visualization. And a pre-vis artist is working with uh, working in 3D and creating animation in 3D, but they're doing it in a little bit more of a simplified form, as you can see here. I mean, this is from this is previs for the world for the movie World War Z. Um, but obviously, you know, the 3D model of the driver doesn't look exactly like Brad Pitt. He's not perfect down to the poor detail. But that's not the point at this step. These are artists that are more interested in the big picture. They're interested in the cinematography, how the story is being told visually. And uh, it's a good thing that they like that because that is what they're responsible to do. They work very closely with the director and the cinematographer to create these types of animations. They'll also animate the camera. They'll determine what you know kind of uh, lens is even being used on the camera so that what you get is a simple template, um, a storyboard in motion, if you will, of the entire film. And this is invaluable for then the director to use as a template to get everybody else in the production on the same page moving forward. So these are typically artists that really enjoy working in 3D and animation, but they want to tell the story. They want to get the big picture across um, and kind of create a whole scene like this. All right, so with just you know four very differing uh, careers in mind, let's talk about how Noman is training artists for these kinds of careers in digital production. Uh, let's talk about our academic offerings. Um, so on the screen here, you'll see a bird's eye perspective of all of our academic offerings at Noman. So in the, um, the upper left-hand side there, you'll see we have a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. This is a... Um, uh, fully accredited, full-time four-year degree, um, all of the general ed classes, everything included. Um, it, you'll be learning digital production and walking away from your education with a BFA degree as a result. Um, just next to that on, on the upper right is our certificate program. This is a two-year program that is um, a little bit more advanced and a little bit more intensive than the BFA program. And it's typically utilized by artists who may already have an art degree, but want to come to Noman as a finishing school. Um, or they're not interested in getting a degree, but they want to go into a very intensive program um, to learn digital production in just two years. Just on the bottom row here, we have our foundation in art design, which is essentially a portfolio building course. It helps you build your portfolio at Noman. Um, and I'll tell you more about that in just a bit. And lastly, I wanted to mention that well over 70 of our classes um, that are part of our full-time programs are also taught as individual courses. Now, uh, it's good for you to know that uh, the two offerings on the top row, the BFA and the certificate program, these do require a portfolio submission in order to get accepted into those programs. But the foundation in art and design does not. This is for people who do not yet have a portfolio put together or may want to work on their portfolio. Um, this just involves a conversation with admissions and then enrolling in that course. And then individual courses, no portfolio submission is required. This is just simply something you can enroll in on our website. And our advisors would be happy to help you uh, to determine what might be the best course choice for you, given your skill level. So let's move forward and take a closer look at our Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. This is our main academic offering at Noman. And as I mentioned, it is fully accredited, which means that financial aid is available. Um, a lot of the, the grants and uh, things that you'd be looking into for financial aid uh, going into college in general, you can also look into these here at Noman. This is going to be full time and on campus with, of course, the caveat that we are now currently in quarantine and social distancing. So to that, I'd like to say that Noman is fully online. And uh, we actually custom built our own online learning platform uh, several years ago so that we could start offering some of our classes online. So we utilized that same platform to move all of our full-time programs and all of our individual classes to online learning so that we could continue to make our education available uh, to, to folks that are, we're all in quarantine currently. And a good thing to note about that is we made sure that that platform was designed to be able to provide the same kind of interaction, the same uh, type of learning, um, demos, critique, group critique, all of those things that are gonna be happening in the classroom, we're able to do that online as well. And if you'd like to know more about that experience, you can just simply go to nomen.edu right there on the front page, scroll down, and there is a fantastic uh, video that was produced um, describing what the online learning experience is like at Nomen. So getting back to the BFA, um, when you are in the BFA, you'll have an optional concentration in game art. 
What that means is as you are getting into the program, uh, if you choose specifically to concentrate in game art, that will fine tune a lot of your you know, animation, VFX, and so forth, some of those different classes, and teach you how to do those things specifically within game engines. So that when you graduate and you go out there and you start working in a game studio, you know what you've got to do. You're not gonna have to change up the way that you learn something. You're ready to start working within game production. Now, the entire program in the BFA is designed to cover all of the aspects of what we call a 3D generalist skill set. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna get a very in-depth understanding of the entire 3D production pipeline. You're gonna learn how to do all of those jobs that I listed on the screen earlier. Now, the reason why that's important are two reasons. Number one, getting a very broad foundation allows you then to build more skill sets in the area that you're particularly passionate about. But when you're building it on, a, on that broader skill set, you are essentially someone that not only can do the, the one thing that you love to do, but you know how to do it in context with the pipeline and you're capable of doing more than one thing. This makes you more desirable as a hire at a studio. And also, um, it frankly, is one of the things that actually helps our graduates uh, stand head and shoulders above a lot of other junior artists supplying out there. So it's very important to us. Uh, and also in uh, the program, you'll get to pick out four electives in your last four terms. So within that last year, that's then your opportunity to pick a particular area that you're interested in that you would want to work in long term and build that on top of that, that foundational uh, education in 3D and the pipeline. Um, so a very robust program, uh, you're, you're going to kind of get it all and you're gonna get access to our placement services, which has done a stellar job at very high placement rates in the industry. And you'll have access to ongoing uh, mentorship with educators um, available through uh, Noman, as well as access to your instructors who are all going to be working industry professionals. In fact, every instructor at Noman is required to be presently working as a professional in the area that they are teaching in order for you to receive a 100% current education, learning how they are doing things today, this very moment in the industry. Uh, so that's our four-year program. There's a rolling admission. So there's not just a race to apply in the fall only, but you can apply in the winter, the spring, and the summer as well. And consequently, we have graduates finishing all four terms out of the year. And uh, most of our program students choose to stay on during the summer term, that is to not take a summer uh, break, and if they stay on for all of their summer terms, it actually allows them to finish the program in just three years. Um, so that's a, an overview for you of our Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. Moving forward, I just wanna to touch quickly on our two-year certificate program. Um, as I mentioned, this is more intensive. Uh, it's uh, going to mean more uh, classes in digital production within a shorter period of time. And it is fully accredited. It's full-time on our campus, but now also 100% on our custom-built online platform. And it's going to give you an intensive uh, education to build a foundational 3D skill sets before then choosing a particular area. These would be areas ranging from like animation to uh, character and creature art uh, to VFX and so forth. So again, within just those two years, you get that broad 3D training and then you get to build an area um, of study on top of that that is relating to what you're passionate about doing. Next up, our foundation in art and design. And this is really an incredible resource. Um, this, is a, this is something that we decided to provide because um, if someone applies to Nomen and um, you know, they send in their portfolio and they don't necessarily make it um, on their first time applying into our full-time program, we don't want that to be the end of our conversation with you. We want to be able to point you towards resources to build your portfolio or even before you apply. Um, if our admissions advisors, as they're coaching you, uh, want to recommend, they, they think that might help you put together a portfolio by going through the foundation and art design. This is a chance for you to build your portfolio at Noman, learning from the same instructors that are teaching our programs. Um, so this is a one year course. You don't have to stay in it for the entire year. You can, uh, it's some uh, uh, students, depending on their skill level, are starting a little bit later, um, or you know they're coming in early or just kind of getting what you need. And these are gonna be classes like figure drawing, as Jared was mentioning earlier, anatomy for artists, uh, perspective drawing, color and light theory, visual composition. And then you'll move into some really cool concept design classes like character and creature design, environment design, uh, vehicle and mech design. So this is a foundational course 
that is going to give you the skill sets that you'll need to build an effective portfolio for applying to Nomen um, or really any other type of art school. We actually do have students that come through and take the foundation for the purpose of applying to a different school that is you know, not necessarily teaching digital production, but it could be illustration or um, a discipline that Nomen doesn't teach. Um, so this is a great resource. Um, I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, and it's perfect for, say, for example, a high school graduate who wants to apply to Nomen, uh, but does not yet have a portfolio put together. You could start speaking with an admissions advisor and talking about the artwork that you do have. And you could go into the foundation and start taking uh, the classes in the foundation as a way to help you actively build up your portfolio learning from Nomen, those skill sets, and then you can turn and present your portfolio to apply to the full-time program. If you finish the foundation with a GPA of 3.2 or higher, you automatically get a $500 scholarship towards the BFA. And about half of the classes we teach in the foundation also transfer into uh, taking care of some of those earlier classes in the Bachelor of Fine Arts program. So it's a really great way to essentially kickstart your way towards the BFA, if that's something that is gonna be helpful for you. All right, lastly, I just wanted to mention our individual courses. What these look like is actually, these are actually the same courses that make up our full-time programs. Um, so you could be in class with, um, uh, for example, you could be in class with uh, artists from other studios who are coming in to take an individual class uh, to brush up on particular skills or learn a new skill. Um, or you could be sitting in class uh, with some of our full-time students. But these are individual classes that do not require a portfolio submission. This is something you simply enroll in online. Um, it's well over 70 of our classes, and it's a total of 30 hours of learning spread out over 10 weeks. So that's going to be three hours in a class once per week for 10 weeks. And this is a great way for you to um, start exploring the world of digital production. This is something you're interested in that would love to learn some things about, but also want to get a little bit more of an inside perspective of what it would be like to be taking classes at Nomen. I would strongly suggest taking an individual course at Nomen. Um, if you're a community college student, uh, you could grab an evening or a weekend class at Nomen to start learning some of these skill sets while you're currently working on your first two years of education. Um, and these are all, you know, things and with regards to strategy for what you need to learn that you can discuss with our admissions advisors. Speaking of admissions, I'd like to talk to you about our advisors right now. Um, because the way that we work our admissions team at Nomen is very different than a lot of other art schools. It is not your traditional experience. Um, that is because traditionally admissions are the last people you talk to and you only talk to them to kind of sign documents and send in your portfolio and then you've got to stand back and cross your fingers and hope that one of them calls you and says, hey, you got in. Um, at Nomen, we do it very differently. This is our team of advisors. Um, we have four amazing admissions advisors. They all are, they're all artists themselves, and um, they are able to offer a professional critique on your artwork and coaching with regards to preparing to apply to the programs. In fact, uh, my colleague uh, Xander, who you see up here, he's presently in the chat, uh, ready to answer any questions that you have about Nomen while you're watching this presentation, and he'll help you to know um, what you need to do to get in touch with Nomen moving forward. But um, our admissions team, what they want to do is they want to talk to you at the point that you are simply interested in Nomen. They want to be at the beginning of the process before you ever apply. And they are interested in helping you come up with the plan that's going to work for you to work on your strategy of how you're going to be approaching uh, applying to one of the full-time programs. And a big part of that is they want to make themselves available to, if you need it, to coach you in your artwork. Um, so you can share your portfolio with them, which is simply is a collection of whatever kind of stuff that you've made yourself, whether you feel like that's you know assembled in a very official looking portfolio or it's just a collection of stuff that you've done, they wanna see that. And what they'll do is start offering you some tips and suggestions on how you might be able to tune that up, how you might be able to level up your portfolio, because what they want to do is at the end of that process, um, after they've spoken with you, they wanna be able to present your portfolio to our review committee. That are the ones that determine who we're going to admit into our full-time program. They want to be able to share your story and talk about the interaction that they've had with you. Now, it's not required that you have a massive amount of interaction with our admissions advisors to apply the program, but we want you to know that they are available to you. 
and you should not be concerned about speaking to any one of them, uh, about getting in touch with one of them today. If you feel like you need some more information, or maybe you would appreciate someone helping you tune up your portfolio before you submit it to apply. So they're really kind of your person on the inside that is ready to uh, be your lifeline and help you prepare before you apply to one of our programs. So I can't stress that enough. Um, don't be concerned about uh, you know, uh, interrupting them or, or bothering them. This is their job. This is what they want to do for you. So uh, please feel free to reach out today and Xander will help you know how to do that. Um, moving forward, I just wanted to mention our campus. Um, yes, I know we are, we're all currently in quarantine and, and the campus is not um, open uh, to the public at the moment, but I wanted you to know what you have look, what you have to look forward to. For example, we have many students now that are starting into our full-time programs while in social distancing. We even have students who are out of state that are able to start into one of our full-time programs um, and then you know, with the intention of moving out and uh, attending classes in person on the campus when we're ready to open up the, the campus again. But I wanted to give you a taste of what our fantastic campus is like. So take a look at this. All right, so uh, one of the things that I love about our campus are our digital labs. And as you saw there, uh, we have nine digital labs that are fully equipped with industry standard hardware and software. And these, you know, when the campus is open, these labs are open to our students from about nine in the morning until midnight, so the entire day, seven days a week. Uh, and that's because we don't want you to have to, you know, go out and buy the equivalent type of workstation and software, which would be incredibly expensive. Um, now, for students who are starting into our full-time programs in the LA area, um, you will be able to see in the video on our, our front page and our website about um, online learning at Noman, how we are doing our very best to resource uh, locals with some of these workstations that are, that are from our labs. Um, and we also have uh, very, very robust resources in terms of software that's available um, and whatnot. This is something you can talk with admissions about to see how that's going to fit your situation if you're choosing to enroll or apply to Noman, uh, one of our full-time programs uh, right now, um, which is a very good and viable option. I would definitely strongly suggest that. Um, save some money on needing to move out to LA right away if you're living in another state. So our admissions advisors are available to talk about all of those options with you. Um, with that, I'd like to conclude by just inviting you to experience Noman in the Noman community. In fact, you already are by tuning into this stream. Uh, Noman has done, uh, for many years, we do live events on our soundstage on campus. Uh, and these are events with industry artists uh, talking about projects, events with studios. Um, and we haven't missed a beat. In fact, we started producing even more content and events while um, uh, we have been socially distanced. We've been doing that right here on uh, these streaming platforms. And we've done some fantastic events, including interviews like we've done today with Jared Morantz. We've interviewed Ian McKaig. We've talked to some of the top artists out there making some of our favorite games and films. And it's a chance for you to tune in, to hear from artists, to hear about the production pipeline. Um, you'll be able to also tune into events about particular product pro projects like Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, um, Avengers, Endgame, so forth. Um, when we're having them on campus, they're free to the public, and uh, presently they're all being streamed on our social media platforms. Uh, if you visit our YouTube page, you'll also see that we have organized into playlists well over 100 events that we have streamed live. So this is a library that's available to you for free. Uh, to go in and start hearing from the industry and learning more about this world, especially if you're interested in it. Uh, just as Jared was saying, you know, don't miss an opportunity to learn more about the actual world that you're hoping to work in. And uh, tuning into our events or going back and seeing previously recorded events is a great way to do that. So um, with that, guys, 
I want to say uh, thank you very much. Um, I want to invite you to an open house at Noman. That might sound uh, uh, a little odd during social distancing, but we actually just had our first virtual open house. It was on September the 20th, and we recorded that. So that's going to be viewable on our uh, Twitch channel. You can go back and see the September 20th open house event. And that is that will have been a little bit more of a more in-depth presentation that I've given you today, but also some screen time together with our director of admissions, our director of financial aid. And we even have a great panel with three of our alumni. And even one of uh, two of those alumni are monsters that have been out there working in the industry. And one of those alumni has just recently got it started. She graduated during quarantine and is currently working. And I love the fact that she said she feels like she's apocalypse proof <laughs> because she went to Noman. Um, so that would be a great thing for you to check out if you're wanting to know more about our school and educational options. So guys, thanks so much for tuning in today. Uh, we had a fantastic time with Jared. Um, I'm, it's my pleasure to be able to sh have shared with you about Noman. And I invite you back to watch future streams uh, every Wednesday from 11 a.m. to one in the afternoon. Our chief creative officer, Josh Herman, who is a industry veteran, worked on the Marvel films, has also worked at Cloud Imperium, amongst other studios and projects. He's been uh, having these art jams on Wednesdays uh, as a place where he's currently been working in ZBrush, but talking with the viewers about his creative process, talking about his techniques in ZBrush. I know that lately he's been uh, actually randomly rolling up D&D characters and then modeling them uh, as character designs in ZBrush. So that's been a lot of fun. Uh, we've got a lot of really other amazing events coming up and you can follow us on social media to learn more about those. Um, I do want to tease an event that you'll need to follow us on social media to hear the official announcement where we will be having Jared back on the 29th of October, along with a few other amazing creature designers. And they're gonna be having an art jam live right here on our, uh, our Twitch channel and other social media platforms. So follow us on social media, learn more about that event coming up. It's gonna be our creature feature and we hope to see you there. Thank you very much, everybody.